Welcome to Hear Her Story podcast produced by the Women in Manufacturing Association. I am so excited to be joined today by Kara Madsey, Vice President of Operations Coatings Americas for BASF. Kara is not only a powerful manufacturing leader, but she is also gracious enough to lend her time and expertise on the Women Manufacturing Association Board of Directors. Welcome, Kara. Thank you very much. Glad to be here today. We're thrilled to have you join us for a conversation and chat and an opportunity to share your story in manufacturing. And often when we get starting our conversations, you know, we all have different pathways to where we are professionally present day. You know, so often women that we talk to share that they didn't really know much about manufacturing or it wasn't even something on their radar. And, you know, so often it was a career by accident rather than by choice. And so we'd love to kind of hear a little bit about your journey, but maybe first stepping back to, you know, all of us as youngsters have lots of different aspirations and perhaps you can share a little bit about when you were younger, what were those things that you were interested in and what did you want to be when you grew up? Okay. Well, I would say there's probably a few things over the course of time as I was growing up. Uh, First, when I was much younger, I think there was some influence of where I lived, but also kind of what some of the things I did. I wanted to be an artist or cartoonist. I love to draw and create. Uh, I took, you know, high school and middle school classes, uh, an art major or, you know, things like that. And uh, I was highly influenced when I lived in Texas, but also uh, cartoon characters of Garfield. Um, I actually created my own character, mimicked Garfield and John, and the character's name was Rockadamsey. It was it was a uh, an armadillo and a person. So obviously, if you know Garfield, John and Garfield, it kind of mimicked that. So I had these creativity ideas, and I like colored pencil and 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 details and stuff, not so much the abstract. And obviously now as a chemical engineer, I can see where some of those tendencies have led me down, um, but also how I've integrated maybe some of that creativity that I learned over my years um, and in some of the leadership that I have. Then it kind of went into being a veterinarian. Um, I love animals uh, and I still do. Um, and I still try to help them. And I wish I could have all of them uh, in my own house that I can take care of. Um, but then I had a hard time seeing animals being hurt. And obviously, as a doctor, uh, a, a veterinarian, you'd have to take care of that. And so maybe I thought that wasn't the best profession. Um, and then lastly, kind of staging my life, I think I was introduced to science and chemistry uh, through my dad, but also uh, through the rest of my family that is known to be more in the medical and, and, and engineering fields. And I loved my middle school chemistry class. And lo and behold, I followed the same path as my dad as a chemical engineer as a result. So it kind of was phases in my life of the things that I like to do. I love it. So you went from being interested in art and cartooning to kind of showing a passion for animals and then ultimately embracing this love for science and chemistry, which is so very cool. And to have your dad as an influence as you entered into chemical engineering. And I love your, your, your comics. Did you keep hopefully some of your old comics that you drew of is yes. it Rock-a-Doodle? <laughs> Rock-a-Damsey. So just my name and kind of switching, switching the letters a little bit, but yes, my parents still have one of my cartoon drawings on the wall um, in my old bedroom. So it's kind of fun whenever I go back to visit to, uh, <laughs> to see some of my, my childhood drawings and things that I, that I did or was interested at that time. So it's kind love of fun. It. So do your parents still have your room as it was before you left? My, my no. dude, I'm 46 and I laugh and I go home and my stuff is still there as though I live there. I would say it's still more so um, a, a visitor room, but there's still some remnants of my sister and I, um, maybe some old things or, you know, but they've really made it their own, but you can still say that was our room. So it's kind of fun to go back and visit that. That's very nice and nostalgic. So as you then pursued a degree in chemical engineering, you know, how did you then apply or take that expertise and learning and education and apply it to manufacturing? How did you find manufacturing? Well, kind of, as I mentioned, my father was a huge influence as well as many of them in my family, but sort of when I was drawing and things, I was also very interested in how things worked. I like to build things, create things. I mean, I could probably age myself with the number of toys of Lincoln Logs and Capsella and Legos that I used to play with. Um, but I think so more so is, is more my dad that introduced me to manufacturing. Um, we kind of lived in that environment. My dad was a chemical engineer and works in operations and safety. Um, also for BASF for about 39 years. Uh, my mom was in the medical field. We moved around a lot due to my dad's job. Um, and, and he worked in many manufacturing sites in many different places. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, 
when I was younger, I found, I loved this one chemistry class. It was physical chemistry and, and chemical chemistry, right? And my teacher was so engaging. We got to play with chemicals and put things together and watch things happen. And I just remember coming home and telling my parents about this. And uh, so I think my dad and my mom picked up on this and started talking more about what he does, what they do. And uh, lo and behold, over time, um, uh, you know, I, I just learned different things and it seemed to be interesting. And obviously I was always a part of what we were moving towards, right? And learning what my dad or parents were doing. It really started then, I started interning at the ASF as one of my first opportunities. Um, and I remember sitting in that internship of uh, exactly the site and location and what I was doing and just thinking to myself, I love this. This is so fun. This is what you get to do and see and the people that you're around. It was like a second family. I didn't realize that until later, but I mean, I just remember that moment. And from there, 22 years later, I'm still in manufacturing and I love every part of it. I mean, I've been very fortunate to have and see a lot of things in my career, uh, moving around many, many times in many different business units is project operations, process engineering, to, to operations and plant management, uh, and now leadership over many sites over many countries. I've been in small, medium, and large manufacturing sites, batch, continuous, um, uh, you know, commodity to, to more specialties, startup shutdowns, optimizations. And I did take a little bit of a short stint uh, in, in product management uh, to, to really develop myself and see things from a different angle. But I, I think um, I've really enjoyed my time in manufacturing and I don't want to leave it. So I really, truly put my parents on this and, and thank them for kind of introducing it to me because I love every moment that, that um, I'm part of BASF and, and kind of my team, the teams that I work with in the manufacturing environment. Really cool. Sort of started from an intern to now be a vice president of one of the, the business units for BASF. That's a pretty large leadership trajectory from you for you from intern to that level so what did your rise in manufacturing look like you know often women are looking at how do I get to that vice president role or to that leadership role can you tell us a little bit about what were some of those critical factors to help you rise in your organization and at the company I think several things. I don't think it was just one magic thing. I think a lot of things kind of aligned and, and it really started with me, um, is the passion. I, I really liked what I was doing. Um, of course, performance comes into play as well, but also communicating what I like to do, what I love to do. Um, you know, I have developed this passion within manufacturing and as, a, as I've learned, and it really kind of linked to some of my principles just as an individual, you know, having a song, strong sense of overall integrity, right? I truly believe that I've been taught that growing up, but I see that in, in, in the work that I'm doing today, but also safety focus and that sustainable, sustainable operational excellence. I'm a true believer that how you do something directly relates to what you'll achieve. Um, and then I think other pieces to that is not only the passion, some of your own mindset and behavior, but also that there was advocates and allies for me and, and with me. Um, I was very open to taking different challenges along the way. Um, I took feedback by learning and developing um, through some of that feedback, some easier than others, right? And making adjustments along the way. But I think some of the things is, is kind of grit, as sometimes I like to say. I think it's the persistence and willingness to stay in, even when the stakes were high or the job was challenging. Now, of course, especially when I met with my wife and things, um, you know, we had to balance, you know, where I was going, what we were doing with the, her career, my career, and, and making sure what's good with the family. But I think with all that being balanced, um, I followed my heart and gut, what I love to do no matter what people said or what might they may think or, or what the field of people that I worked with looked like or, or act like, I never thought I shouldn't be there or could not be there or couldn't do it. And even if there was some challenging times for sure, um, it's just not backing down. And personally speaking, that was never really even an option for me. I enjoy it. I believe I believe belong here and I wanted to continue working in the field that I have fun with. And so I think all of those things kind of added up uh, maybe a little luck too, um, of how those things have come to where I am today. Excellent. So it sounds like lots of ingredients, as you said, it wasn't j just one magic item or one magical thing that got you to where you are present day, but a lot of passion and grit and perseverance. You mentioned feedback as well, which I think is interesting. We talk about that a lot as one of those barriers often for women rising in industry that they're often sadly not given the feedback that they need to perhaps 
um, perfect or to work on certain areas of their leadership style or performance. You also mentor, mentioned mentorship. Um, so, so as you look at kind of current day mentorship, um, both from you personally to your, to your, um, to those that mentor you, how impactful has mentorship been um, for you professionally? I think huge. Um, you know, I have been a, a mentor uh, or a mentor and a mentee over the course of, of my 22 years in the ASF. Um, and, and I think, you know, in my mentee experience, um, I have one that I've worked with for years and actually was an old boss of mine and we just stayed in touch over the years. She knows me extremely well, probably sometimes better than myself. Um, I really enjoy bringing challenges that, challenges that I'm working on uh, to talk with her. Uh, feedback to improve upon, thoughts that I had, and, and gaining feedback back on them. Um, and in return, I received support, honest feedback, and challenges right back. So I think it was a healthy relationship that helped me develop. But I've also had coaches along the way uh, for very specific development plan opportunities or working on leveraging my strengths. You know, they always say, you know, strengths are great. Your weaknesses don't need to become strengths, but how do you balance those out a little bit? And also coaches on transitioning to a new role. And I think they really helped me learn and develop and give me some things to think about um, and specific actions I can take. And I totally believe this has been one aspect that has helped me uh, be the leader I am today. But on the other side, being a mentor, I think um, it has also helped. Um, I really love helping people and paying it forward, as I often say, um, is I've learned from those experiences. They've been really important and impactful to me. And so how can I help someone else that maybe where I was once, at, you know, growing up through this, um, you know, manufacturing world, you know, I can give perspective, I can be a listening ear, I can share experiences, uh, but I think the most important things I can learn from the, from the other person as well, which really helps to continue to improve, um, to become more aware, and there is an opportunity to both inspire and motivate each other. And I think that's the important partnership that you have. You're not always trying to help the other person, but you can gain something very valuable out of it as well. Um, so that's kind of where, you know, mentoring, menteeing was very uh, important in my career and still is to this day. Wow, that, that's, I, I liked your statement, especially about that weaknesses don't have to become strengths. You just need to find a way to balance those weaknesses against your strengths. And I think your comments about mentorship are so very powerful. And the amount that we as maybe who are more mature or veteran in our career or who have been that, there's such great benefit for us on the reverse side as we're mentoring as well, learning from those that are our mentor mentors as well as mentees. Um, there's tons of great takeaways and learning that can happen. So as you look at kind of present day pandemic, I think are we what officially 20 or 21 months into pandemic, we've all been obviously... Uh, we've learned new ways to work. We've learned new ways to lead. And as you look at the teams that you lead, Kara, and your organization, you know, how has the, what has leadership been like during a period of pandemic for you? I think for, during the pandemic, you know, there's, there's things that have affected me, but I tried to keep it somewhat consistent of my other times just to not have yet something new um, under a very challenging time. You know, I think I have evolved over time as teams and organizations are not always the same and cannot always be developed, motivated, inspired, or even led the same way um, that the other one was. But I, I think the big thing, as I mentioned earlier, is, you know, I stay true to my values and principles. And, and those for me are safety and security of myself and others. This integrity piece, right? The ownership, the, the accountability, the responsibility, doing the right thing. But then this operational excellence. I know it's a coined word, but um, I, I truly believe how we do something or how I do something directly relates to what we will achieve. I'm a true believer on that, whether it's training for a marathon or you know, leading an organization. Um, a few things with that, I think, is, is you know, with this leadership, I, I try to lead with purpose, passion, and poise right? Um, I really like what I do. So I naturally, the energy comes out and sometimes I have to manage that um, uh, from that perspective. But, uh, you know, I set expectations early. I share about myself personally and professionally. I try to be as genuine as possible and vulnerable about my strengths and opportunities because by no means I'm not perfect. I, sometimes I try to be, but it, it doesn't work out that way. But I also think about, you know, what do we need to do to sustainably win? And perhaps this is the competitive athlete in me. Um, and, and, you know, I even used an example uh, in one of my sites. Um, it was a big football community. And I related manufacturing to a football team. 
and then women winning the national championship. So I try to find ways to adapt to the team that we have and what we, the objective we try to, to do. But it's always, how can we make it better? How can we sustainably win? And I think the, the other component of this is, you know, we've always, I've always tried to start and maintain and develop a team mentality, a one team. Uh, so in developing a, a good team is what's important in a team member, right? The talent, the mindset and behavior, the focusing on fundamentals, the, the, the drive to continuously improve themselves and the team and the organization. But it also starts with developing trust, right? Trust within each other and the team, being able to be challenging each other and create more of that ownership and then ultimately commitment and accountability to drive to results. And I think we had to do this a little differently over COVID, for example, or during the pandemic, we had to find ways to connect during a virtual world. And it wasn't very easy, but the more we talked, the more we tried to get into this mentality around each other and helping each other and listening to each other and building that trust, I think it was easier to kind of overcome some of these natural uh, differences around us. You know, in, in many cases too, I had to balance myself. Um, I'm a bit of a pace setter leader. And I think in many of my roles in my career, it was needed or required, something like that. But I think over time, and especially during this pandemic and situations of the world today, um, I really recognized a bit more listening, empathy, and advocacy, and even allyship in certain situations. The situational leadership, you know, adding a bit more of that emotional intelligence has been more necessary to really build, empower, drive, and sustain a, an organization or a team. And so I think that was probably the biggest thing for me over the course of, of this pandemic and, and not and being more virtual than present in some cases um, and, 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 and from that perspective. Now, going back to leadership in general, um, I think we have to find ways to show the purpose. Why are we going and driving in the way we're going? Uh, what goal do we need to achieve? Um, making sure people have skin in the game and usually doing that is explaining why is it important to them or why is it important to the team or the organization and the customer. So I think in the big scheme of things, you know, trying to build a team where there's diversity, we want an inclusive environment. I truly believe that um, if someone feels they belong, right, and they're part of the team, um, they may want to contribute a bit more and feel more empowered to make a positive difference. Um, so I think all of these things add up in how you approach a team um, and knowing the situation, whether it's in the middle of a pandemic or not, um, of how you kind of bring people together and recognize their strengths and know that they can add value to the team and then driving toward wherever that goal or objective is. So I think, you know, a lot there and every situation is a little different, but I kind of keep the same kind of mentality and principle um, as I work with my teams and be a part of the team, uh, as well as not only leading it. Those are all excellent pieces of advice for, again, helping people understand the why, why are we doing things, I think is so critically important, especially during challenging times, um, but obviously relevant outside of even pandemic periods as well. So as you look at kind of your career, are there certain challenges or kind of obstacles that you faced along the way that, that kind of stick out that you recall kind of overcoming and a being kind of an accomplishment and one of those aha moments for you professionally and one of those kind of personal um, periods of, of accomplishment when you felt like, gosh, I got over this big challenge or hurdle and now I've had some lessons learned or I can be more successful in the future. Is there a certain instance that stands out? There's probably a few. And, and I would say, because I've had this question asked before is, you know, what was your favorite role? And honestly, I can't tell you because I think every single one of them was favorite. Um, now, granted, there's probably better ones than others, um, just for different reasons or timing in my life. But I think I've always gained some form of valuable learning experience or, or some, which I love, challenges to overcome. Um, as I kind of maybe alluded to in a couple of the other discussion points is I'm a pretty structured person. Um, I'm pretty fundamental. Uh, operational discipline, the how is really important to me. Um, but I really care about people um, a lot. Um, and, and I have this huge team mentality and I also like to make things better than they were before. And it's even better when we can do it together. So in my last two roles prior to my current role uh, were pretty challenging. Um, and at the, But at the same time, I think, extremely rewarding personally and professionally. Um, 
but they followed similar themes. Um, they basically are around organize, organizational or business turnarounds under very difficult conditions. So one was a consolidation and a divestment of an operation while trying to grow at the same time another, right? So we were, we're balancing and, and, and really focusing on people, operations, and cost. And the other one was really turning around a site or a business to be profitable, where we had to address the core needs of the manufacturing site that I was leading, but also more moving to extremely fast uh, to meet a more strategic and tactical business objective, right? But I think, you know, of those, when you talk about the corporate and things you need to do, I think there was a bit more that I learned from that. And it was more than just the dollars and cents. It was about the people, the team, the differences, uh, rallying a diverse group of people with different perspectives and backgrounds and beliefs, obviously in a very challenging set of situations. And we needed to have all hands on deck. So it kind of leads back a little bit to leadership in that perspective. But I think what I learned from these experiences was about listening, seeking to understand and coming to some form of common ground because everybody's at a different place um, physically, mentally on some of these challenges. And we may see things differently, but how do we approach each other with dignity and respect in order to still move forward as a team or one team to meet that objective? And I think some of the things that I really learned and I want to, to highlight here a little bit is it's helped me see things more clearly than maybe I've seen before. And one is don't lose sight of the fundamentals. Safety is a value, respecting and valuing people. You know, this operational best discipline type mentality um, of doing it right the first time. Control what you can control. I like the adage, have a plan and work the plan. Um, and how you do it really makes a difference. So a lot of those things really stuck with me from that perspective. But then again, along the way, kind of confirming that also the soft stuff was essential as well, is really important on situational communication and leadership. This personal and social awareness, more of the emotional intelligence, empathy, inclusion, authenticity, resiliency. And bottom line of all these different challenges is leading with passion and purpose. Be a part of it, understand it, and help people through it during some of these things so we can win or sustainably win at the end. So in many cases, I think this was some rocky ground, resistance, challenge, all of those things. But the, the fun part was we persevered. All of the sites and businesses were left at a better place than where they began, even though there was some tough decisions and things that needed to be made. But all of these experiences that, uh, you know, really helped me develop um, personally and professionally. And I'm just so grateful and thankful for all the people that I've journeyed with along the way in these more challenging situations. And those things will never be forgotten. I mean, your last two roles sound like they were challenging but rewarding ones with lots of lessons learned as you went to work at kind of at a turning around a business or, um, you know, divestiture and all those, those complex parts of manufacturing operations. So it sounds like it was a very rewarding period. Are you feeling inspired by our guest's manufacturing journey? Elevate your own path to success by enrolling in an education program produced by the Women in Manufacturing Education Foundation. The WIMEF creates opportunities for you to collaborate, network, learn, and grow through our programs, which are built for individuals from all areas of manufacturing, from production floor leaders to the C-suite. Graduates gain actionable insights and competencies needed to grow in the manufacturing space. For more information on the educational programs delivered through the Women in Manufacturing Education Foundation, please visit our website at www.wimef.org. So as we get to the end of this calendar year, it's crazy that it's almost the end of 2021. I know lots of us are goal setting. We're looking at, you know, what do we want to do personally and professionally for the rest of this year and into 2022? Are there certain goals that you've set for yourself personally and professionally? I mean, for, for this year, and, and obviously there may be some of the same, but just depending on the type of priority or what the year brings us up, I'm not really, I'm a goal setter. Um, I'm not necessarily a New Year's resolution person, but from a, I always like to have a goal because I like to achieve, right? I like to knock it out and take the next one out. I think personally for this past year and, and obviously going forward is to be safe and healthy. I mean, that's mentally, that's physically. Um, that's of my family, that's of my team, right, from that perspective, and taking care of, of others as well. 
um, from a professional standpoint, you know, this is my second full year in my current role. Uh, last year was really, you know, about getting settled in very quickly because we jumped right into COVID, right? And um, it was difficult because of some of that, but I also saw some really great bonding as a team and really driving our organization in a positive direction. We made some significant changes even under a difficult year. Um, I think some of my other goals were, were twofold. One, obviously my leadership. Um, I always have room for improvement, um, given feedback and observation, how can I better engage myself and learn, but also to empower, develop my overall team as well and taking us to the next level. And then lastly, I think I have a real passion for manufacturing, of course, as I keep talking about it, but also diversity and inclusion. Uh, we're taking a lot of very positive efforts within BASF over the time that I've been with BASF for the past 22 years, but also here even the, in the last several years. You know, personally, I want to be the very best role model I can be uh, for those types of behaviors um, to drive a more inclusive culture in our overall organization. Um, I try to do that every single day. And I think sometimes I'm still learning um, and doing the right things, but I have intentionally made it a point. Like, for example, and I stay true to this, um, in International Women's Day, uh, we had a choose to challenge statement we wanted to all submit. And mine was this. By reaching out, seeing, saying, doing something to create a diverse and inclusive environment where we treat each other with dignity and respect, where we welcome and encourage people to be their true selves, feeling valued, having a sense of belonging, that their ideas, work, and perspectives matter, that they are a part of a team. We are stronger together, one team. So I think every single line item I try to do every single day um, to really build that team, uh, like I've mentioned in several of the other things, and I guess my commitment to all of these things that I have said is really to engage, to just do it. See something, say something, do something. Whether it's being an advocate or an ally, to partner and stand up for, to pay it forward, whether it's helping someone through their career or learning something along the way or helping develop the organization on that particular challenging project, or just walking the talk, trying to be the very best role model I can be, even though I feel, as mentioned, I'm still learning. You know, I truly believe this because it's happened to me um, in my journeys is sometimes it only takes one person, one thing to get something started to change or be, to be realized or expected. Um, and what you say, what you do, how you act, we may not even know how much that really may impact someone, hopefully for the positive, but also your reactions could be negative as well. So I've learned that in little things that have happened in my career I've picked up on, and uh, I hope I can just pay it forward in those ways as well. Wow, that's so many words of wisdom. I especially like your statement of see something, say something, and do something. And I think your statement around, uh, that you made on International Women's Day is very powerful. So as we look at kind of our closing for most of our episodes of Hear Her Story, we'd like to go through some rapid fire questions. So just to get a little more um, knowledge and kind of intel as to things that you like and maybe some great recommendations of things other people should check out. So first, we always like to start with, what is your favorite quote? Well, I have two, real winners are ordinary people with extraordinary determination. My parents had that picture uh, uh, quoted on my room when I was younger, and it really stuck with me, and I've kind of learned over the years it's true. Um, my second is, a river cuts through rock, not because of its power, but because of its persistence, and this also very much resonates with me. Those are both great quotes. And your favorite book? Um, my favorite book is probably, and this is probably more of a professional book, but I think it's true to other things in life as well, is The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lessioni. Um, I have used this book and concept for most of my teams in my career that I've worked with. Um, it's just such a logical approach. It's a fable, so it's an easy read, um, but it also is very pointed on the understanding of how trust, healthy conflict, commitment, accountability, and results kind of all play together, and it's more team-oriented. It's a great book. I've, I've used that as well. It's very powerful. And your favorite movie or movies? So I have three um, for three different reasons. Uh, one are any of the Avenger movies, um, especially the Avengers Endgame, but I would say they're just awesome. And uh, hint, hint, secretly, I wish I had superpowers. So I think I just <laughs> leave, I live vicariously through them um, that I wish I had some form of a superpower. Um, my second movie is The Miracle. It's a Disney movie. Um, it's about the 1980 U.S. hockey team and the Olympics. Uh, the things I love about this movie is it's about leadership. 
I love his coaching style for this particular team. Um, it's about team uh, that we all need to play together and they win and being a sports advocate and playing sports in my life, I'm very competitive. So this was awesome. Um, and I think it also talks about things like fundamentals, roles of team members, challenging how to do something different, trust in the team. And one of my favorite quotes that I've even used with my team is, um, you know, the name on the front is a hell of a lot more important than the one on the back. Um, and I say this because I believe that manufacturing is very much like a sports team. Everyone has a role, responsibility, and skill set, and we all need to play together to win. Um, so that's kind of my more, you know, kick butt, you know, go out there and win type um, uh, sports engagement that I just really watch loving and watch over and over again. And then the last one, just because of the holidays, I cannot, uh, it'd be remiss to, to say it was a Christmas vacation with Chevy Chase. Absolutely fantastic movie. I swear to goodness, we watched this as a family year after year, probably about 25 times during the course of the holidays and probably can quote the movie. So uh, love it. It's funny and it makes me laugh. Love it. That's one of my favorite Christmas movies as well. <laughs> And it is, it is hysterical just because I love how everything goes so wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think it, awesome. it kind of, it's that kind of homage to the fact that things aren't always idyllic and perfect. And, you know, we try to put up sometimes these, these great fronts that things are picture perfect and they aren't. And I just love that movie. It is hysterical. I've never seen the miracle. I'll have to check that out. On Disney. You need to check it out. It's, it's quite good. If you like I likewise, as a, I'm a huge Marvel fan, more mm -hmm. of a, a newer Marvel fan. And it was actually a whim two win members that had suggested that I watch them. And so my son and I started a marathon of watching the Marvel movies in the recommended order, not by chronological order. Yep. And I am truly addicted as well. I also wish I had superpowers. I don't know which one I would pick, but they yeah. are all great. And I love, I, especially love the women characters. I totally agree. Um, Black Widow is a good one. So if you're looking yes. for a woman character, but all of them are very good regardless. Um, it's awesome. They are, they are, it's a great franchise. So as we look to uh, kind of your, you know, first job, we like to often hear what, what was that first thing that you did professionally and maybe uh, did it influence at all kind of future things? I would say it's probably more unique uh, when I tell this sometimes I'm a little embarrassed, but um, my first one was babysitting. I was the local neighborhood babysitter. Um, I guess, you know, I learned obviously taking care of people and, um, and, and, and accountability for certain things. You know, my parents really wanted me to focus on my school and sports commitments growing up. Um, but I would say, trust me, I still had my chores and responsibilities. I didn't get off that easy, right? Um, but then I really, I jumped right into BASF as an intern um, while I was in the summer months while I was at college at Penn State. Um, I did have some engineering roles, manufacturing. I couldn't really co-op during that time because I ran um, cross country and track for Penn State. And so I just used my summers to learn there. And then I rolled right into the PDP program, the professional development program in BASF and haven't left since. So I kind of jumped from babysitting to engineering. So um, with a lot of things in between, I think. Love it. Babysitting was my first job as well. I started, I think at age 11 in my neighborhood as well. Yep. So it's a good, it's a good way to start response, as you said, Absolutely. it kind of instills responsibility and priorities in taking care of others, which is all important present day. So I know you probably don't have tons of downtime in your very busy role and um, with your responsibilities, but how do you enjoy spending your downtime? So spending downtime, um, like I said, I'm, I'm pretty much a kind of a simple person. Um, I love being with my family, my wife and our dog. Um, they truly make me happy. Um, I think being outside, um, doing anything, going for a walk, a hike, just being, going to a brewery, you know, anything of those, just being outside and enjoying the fresh air and the sun just kind of re-energizes you. And I think working out, doing some form of sports, keeping myself healthy, um, competitive, I guess, in some way. Um, and then visiting times at our, our, our favorite cities or cool places and things. Um, and then, of course, uh, I'm not much of an extrovert, so I just like spending quality time with a good family and, and good friends, just a small group of people that um, just, I don't know, it just takes your mind off of things and makes you happy. So those are some of the basic things I spend downtime on. Excellent. And what was the last place you traveled and the next place you plan to travel? 
Well, the last place we traveled was Asheville, North Carolina for my wife's birthday. And if you haven't been, please go. It's one of our favorite cities um, and in places to go. Um, we spent the day literally walking around everywhere. We didn't even get in the car. We went hiking. We visited breweries, wineries, and just the art section and everything. Uh, went for hikes in the woods, et cetera. We even took our dog, Cooper, which was great because he goes with us pretty much everywhere. Um, just absolutely love that place. So highly recommend Asheville, North Carolina has it going on. And um, by the end of the year, next travel, I'm still continuing to visit some of my sites, manufacturing sites across uh, five different countries, um, and then visiting some families over the holiday, which is a good thing. Look forward to seeing them again in the next couple of weeks. Very nice. And I have never, I know I went to Asheville once, but I've not been there in recent years. So I definitely will have to go back because it was back when I was in grad school, which was a long, long time ago. <laughs> awesome place. And our closing question that we often like to end with is what one piece of advice would you want to share with the next generation of women in manufacturing? And again, like I've said before, it's not just one thing. I probably have a few messages, um, but I'll keep them short and sweet. Uh, first, uh, the mindset. Uh, girls or women can do anything. This was, by the way, another quote my parents had on my wall growing up. Um, be genuine and authentic. Lead with integrity follow your passion and heart, pay it forward to help each other, persistence, poise, and resi resiliency, situational leadership and communication, which I've learned a lot, that not everything is created the same. So you might have to address things um, and, and, and um, work through things differently, depending on the situation. And more than ever, listen, listening or listening, empathy and advocacy, uh, which are all basic principles or leadership principles that we should all have regardless of the role. But I think the number one last thing that I would say is believe you belong because you do. So go out there and do your very best because that has a, you have the passion to be able to do so. So enjoy it. What great pieces of advice. You are an amazing person. Your parents sound like amazing people. I love so many of these quotes that they helped early on kind of instill in you. Um, and kind of, it sounds like they're greatly supportive in your career and profession. So Again, thanks for this conversation. It was so wonderful to hear your story, Cameron Madsey. And we just so appreciate all the support that you give to our organization, as well as to our efforts and, and your efforts to support women in manufacturing. So thanks so much. Well, thank you very much for the time today. Being able to share a little bit myself and some experiences. Again, we learn every day on the different things from others and uh, what the world brings us and how we, how we take it. Thank you for listening to Hear Her Story, a podcast produced by the Women in Manufacturing Association. Be sure to share, review, and subscribe to Hear Her Story on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. In the past 10 years, more than 3,000 new apprenticeship programs have been established within U.S. manufacturing, representing 128% growth within the industry. This isn't surprising since registered apprenticeship programs give employers access to a diverse pool of talented potential employees. The Women in Manufacturing Association has partnered with Jobs for the Future to connect our members and their companies with a streamlined way of recruiting, retaining, and training women in manufacturing through their own registered apprenticeship programs. For more information on how to build your own registered apprenticeship program, please visit our website at womeninmanufacturing.org.